let's begin with a clear definition of what issues management is so that we can really dig into its implications for risk management and crisis communication. Heath argues, and I agree, that issues management is stewardship for building, maintaining, and repairing relationships with stakeholders and stake seekers. I really like this notion of stewardship because it suggests that organizations are more than profit-making machines whose mission is only to serve their shareholders. That's simply not the case in a modern and very global environment. All organizations have responsibilities to a number of different types of stakeholders internally, as well as local, regional, national, and often global levels. To begin to get a picture of how complex the stakeholder environment can be for organizations, let's take a brief look at just how many different types of stakeholders might exist at the four levels, internal, local, national, and international. In some cases, these might be the same stakeholders, but in others, even if they're in the same category, they may be entirely different stakeholders. For example, an organization might have to deal with a number of different regulatory bodies. In the US, that could be at city, county, state, or national levels alone. In the EU, you might be dealing with city and regional regulations, but also national, EU, and even international regulations, and that's just one type of stakeholder group. This is why issues management is so vital. Organizations face increasingly complex stakeholder environments. But if we're going to understand issues management, we do need to talk about issues themselves. In the introduction of the stakeholder relationship model, I argue that organizations ought to view their behaviors and business practices through the eyes of their stakeholders because their stakeholders determine whether the organization is sustainable or not. Within the context of the SRM model, issues could represent anything from the products or services that the organization offers to those topics related to an organization's business in which a stakeholder is interested. In short, issues represent risks or opportunities for organizations because they're often the glue that connects the organizations and different stakeholders together. However, within the context of the process of issues management, we have to consider a more technical and precise concept. So in issues management, issues represent a controversial gap between an organization's behavior and their stakeholders' expectation. Keep in mind that different stakeholders can have different expectations. This is what makes issues management in modern organizational environments so challenging. Resolving these differences can lead to important consequences for organizations. These consequences can be quite positive. An organization might improve their relationship with the stakeholders and solve a problem without it becoming a crisis. However, where there's an issue, there's always a risk. Organizations face a lot of potential problems or issues on a daily basis. No organization has the resources or ability to solve every potential problem that can emerge, so where should it start? Expectancy violation theory gives us a starting point for understanding the two criteria for initiating issues management. Organizations should consider an issues management process when there is a clear violation of the stakeholders' expectations for an organization's behavior, products, services, and so on, and also when that violation could result in a controversy. That is, where there's a risk to the organization if it does not address the problem. Let's give ourselves a bit more background in expectancy violation theory so we can better understand the process of risk assessment for organizations. Expectancy violation theory is an interpersonal communication theory that we can borrow from and apply in an organizational context. It emphasizes an individual perception of the interaction between people or in our case, a stakeholder and the organization in a particular situation. So when we communicate, people create an expectation of how the other will react. Violation of this expectation can cause the perception that will be either positive or negative. In an organizational context, for example, when you go to a bakery and ask for something from the counter, both you and the staff behind the counter have an expectation for how that interaction will go. But what happens if it doesn't go to plan? Let me give you an example. When we moved to Germany, my husband and I went to the local bakery for a coffee and a bun one morning. We were a bit slow in trying to figure out what we wanted when the first employee asked for our order. 
So she left and we figured out what kind of coffee we wanted. So a second woman came up and asked if we knew what we wanted to drink. So we ordered our coffee. The first woman returned and asked if we knew what we wanted to eat. And by that point, we'd made our decision and ordered. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary to us. However, the staff realized they were both serving us and we got a polite but very firm telling off because we had monopolized both employees' time and that we should order everything together and the same person would get everything. So this is an example of both an interpersonal expectancy violation, but also an example of a routine customer service issue that was affected by different cultural expectations and different social scripts. For us, it seemed normal because it would happen in the UK and the US, but in Germany, not so much. So this gives you a sense of what expectancy violation can look like in a fairly benign kind of circumstance. If we understand the key characteristics to Burgoon's expectancy violation theory, then we can go back and connect that to the stakeholder relationship model. Burgoon argues there are two types of expectancies, predictive, defining the communication and interaction happening within a particular environment or context, and prescriptive, people displaying behaviors appropriate to the existing environment. She also argues that expectations are determined broadly by three factors. First, interactant characteristics, so this includes age, sex, or personality traits of the person that makes a listener create an expectation of the speaker's behavior. Second, relationship characteristics that deals with the relationship between the speaker and the listener. And third, the environment. The context refers to the cultural influence as well as the social situation. All of these factors lead to an expectation in the behavior between the speaker and the listener. So it's easy to conceive of a violation from the expected behavior, and that can be either positive or negative. For instance, if we expected a gym instructor to hassle us because we were out of shape, but instead that person offered support and reassurance that we were normal in this respect, that unexpected behavior for most people might make us want to come back. However, if they were even harsher than we expected or we felt judged, that could be a negative expectation and would be less likely to return. Now, if these three factors seem somewhat familiar, it's because they align with the stakeholder relationship model that I discussed in a previous podcast. When we start with the assumption that stakeholders have expectations of organizations that are connected to the stakeholders' personal interests, their connection to the organization, as well as the larger organizational environment, then it's easier to think about the risks inherent for organizations in violating different stakeholder expectations of that organization. So when we ask what is an issue within the context of issues management, we begin with the assumption that the organization has violated an expectation. When we adopt a stakeholder-centered view of organizations and crisis communication, that means we also need to think about issues management as a process that's more than just managing an organization's risk, but also as a process that manages the relationships between organizations and their stakeholders. So his perspective on issues management that's centered in his argument that it's stewardship for building, maintaining, and repairing relationships with stakeholders and stake seekers means that he argues that successful issues management has four characteristics. First, it enhances an organization's ability to plan and manage its activities. Second, it enhances an organization's to ability to behave in ethical and socially responsible ways as part of routine business. Third, it enhances an organization's ability to monitor its environment. And fourth, it enhances the organization's ability to develop a strategic dialogue to manage relationships much more effectively. For issues management to be successful, it cannot be reactionary. It must be viewed as an anticipatory process. In his analysis of issues management, Meng identified a five-stage issues life cycle encompassing the potential, emerging, current, crisis, and dormant stages of an issue. In simple terms, as the issue moves through the first four stages, it attracts more attention and becomes less manageable from the organization's point of view. Let's borrow from a healthcare analogy. Early detection is the best approach to managing issues, which is both 
the organization's and in the stakeholder's interest. If an organization is able to identify issues before they are triggered by an event, a whistleblower, the media, consumers, or any one of the organization's internal or external stakeholders, then the organization has more opportunities to meaningfully address the issue. Mm -hmm. However, as the issue matures, the number of engaged stakeholders, publics, and other influencers expands, and the position on the issue becomes much more entrenched, meaning that the choices available to the organization necessarily shrink. If we think about issues management in complex environments, then organizations should be anticipating stakeholder desires related to the issues and evaluating the potential organizational impact of those issues should they develop into crises. One way to think about the role of issues management is to compare two cases. These cases compare the changes that accompanied China's hosting of the 2008 Summer Olympics and the emergence of the mad cow disease in the U.S. in 2003. In the end, these cases also demonstrate why stakeholder stewardship is in an organization's strategic best interest. The 2008 Beijing Olympics prompted a lot of changes in China. One of the examples of laws that were changed were a whole group of safety laws and regulations. Naturally, China knew that they would be in the world's eye in a way that they hadn't been before, so laws were introduced and were the outcome of lobbying by various stakeholders, including health and safety agencies and car manufacturers. The emerging trend reflected in the laws was an increased attention being paid to health and safety concerns in the city, including air quality, motor vehicle safety, and traffic reduction. One of these changes was a law that made retrofitting of car sunroofs illegal in Beijing and actually left a nationwide manufacturer in trouble. The sunroof manufacturer was caught in the crossfire of stakeholder interests and being unable to respond effectively. The outcome was substantial and quite negative. The manufacturer failed to anticipate the laws or their impact, and in their case, it meant financial ruin. By contrast, Mad cow disease had been on the issues management radar of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association in the U.S. for years when, in 2003, the first case was identified in the U.S. By anticipating the event and mapping out a goal-driven response in advance, the association was able to respond very quickly. This was also helped by the fact that they only had one infected animal that happened to have been imported from Canada, so it was quickly identified. Their response was multi-layered, and it included direct consultation with regulators, consumer advocacy groups, and other key stakeholders, as well as an intensive national and international news media outreach. They also had evaluation measures ready to go, and as a result, beef demand actually rose by 8% in 2004, and consumer confidence in American beef increased from 88% just before the event in 2003 to 93% in 2005. The takeaway point to this is that issues management is more than just crisis avoidance. It's about understanding how social, political, economic, and environmental expectations are shifting and for organizations and associations being able to manage that change. When done well, issues management can even lead to an increased profitability. But when done poorly, it not only can lead to a crisis, but may mean that the organization simply cannot function. If the National Cattlemen's Beef Association in the United States provides us with a good example of issues management, then we can break it down into a set of assumptions about why issues management is important. So in order to devote adequate resources to issues management, organizations need to make four assumptions about it. First, an organization must assume that issues management is essential to good strategic business planning. This means that the organization must evaluate its key value proposition, identify its stakeholders and the stakes that matter to both the organization and its stakeholders, and then create and implement plans of action that connect all of these components. Second, an organization must assume that it is responsible to a variety of stakeholders. However, to whom the organization is responsible will certainly vary by industry, value proposition, and an organization's ethics. 
but this assumption means that the organization believes it has some level of social responsibility. Remember that our definition of issue management focused on an organization's responsibility to be good stewards of stakeholder interests. Third, when I talk about intelligence, naturally I'm talking about good information and how we use information to make judgments. The assumption is that without good intelligence, organizations cannot make good decisions. For example, organizations ought to understand key stakeholders and their likely reactions to situations before making decisions. Similarly, organizations ought to understand key situational factors that might influence its ability to respond. Finally, good engagement and communication should be assumed to be an important part of issues management. The process is always grounded by a basic campaign approach emphasizing identifying key goals and audiences, setting key measurable objectives, and developing a well-grounded strategy that will let you meet the measurable objectives. And finally, good measurement and evaluation to be able to benchmark those objectives.